uh, hours of service. And that is Pastor Mark, live long and prosper. <laughs> That thought occurred to me earlier today, too, but since he, he brought it up, so I can get away with it. <laughs> Last week, I spoke to you about God and about how different people perceive God and about the way they understand God. And um, this was part of a process of trying to understand them so that we can have good conversations without yelling at each other. I do want to point out that the yelling part, not yelling, that's our responsibility. Um, I have, I'm giving no guarantees that if you ask the kinds of questions that I'm suggesting that you ask to start healthy, easy conversations with people, I'm not guaranteed that they're not going to start yelling at you. They might. Uh, and in fact, if you're doing this online, if you're doing a Facebook conversation or a blog post or something like that, almost certainly somebody's going to start doing that terrible thing in internet etiquette and start typing at you in all capital letters. Right, because that's the closest thing we have to screaming at each other um, when we have no idea who we're talking to. <laughs> Today's topic is about what is real, which sounds a little bit abstract, but I'm going to try to make it real for you and, and pertinent to you. I want to start off by doing a little bit of an experiment. I'd like you, each of you to turn to the person next to you, look them in the eye, and then poke them in the shoulder. Go ahead, some, I'm seeing some non-compliant people, go ahead. Okay, all right. This is a little science experiment. How many of you felt a person poking you in the shoulder? Do you know the biology of this is amazing? What happens is, is you've got nerve endings in your skin, and when you, somebody pushes their finger into your shoulder, the skin responds, the nerve receptors pick up that information, transmit it to the brain, the brain processes that information, and then says, hey, somebody's poking me. And science has been tremendous in terms of explaining to us how this works, and it's really wonderful and amazing as part of our, the way our bodies work. It's the way that we know, for example, that it's electrical impulses that make this happen, not little leprechauns running up and down in our arms communicating with our brain. Okay, because it's not a myth, this is the way the body works, and that's fine. That's the material world, you're talking about how we respond physically to things. Okay, but there was something else that was going on while you were doing that. I heard a lot of giggling and laughing. I saw some people, a couple of people back there, they didn't just go doink, like that. They were like, <laughs> they were doing it back at each other. I didn't tell them to do it back at each other. I didn't tell you to enjoy it. I didn't tell you to laugh. <laughs> Why did that happen? There's something going on that it's not your physical response. There's something relational in that process of poking somebody in the shoulder, having to look at them while you're poking them in the shoulder. Science does a great job of explaining to us how the nerve endings work. They don't do a very good job of dealing with this question of this mind thing, of your consciousness and the emotion that you felt when you had the opportunity to push into somebody's shoulder. So the worldview that you have reflects or influences the way that you're going to respond to that kind of an issue. Because some worldviews deal with the question of this, the emotions and things like love and responding to beauty in a very different way than Christianity does. And I want to address this by looking at how one famous scientist starts all of his explanations. This is the scientist, the famous astronomer Carl Sagan. About 30 years ago, he wrote a book, and then he produced a television series and hosted it uh, called Cosmos, and last week was the first episode of a new version of Cosmos. He began the series with an amazing claim. He said, the cosmos, the stuff that we see all around us and out into the universe, is all that is, ever was, and ever will be. That is a huge claim, and I only have 10 minutes. So I'm going to take just one piece of that puzzle. When you encounter somebody who says something big like that, your response doesn't have to be, that's too big for me to handle. The response can be, is that true? The cosmos is all there is. And you can say, is that true? And then they're going to say, almost certainly they're going to say, yeah, of course it is. 
And then your next question should be, how do you know that's true? How does Carl Sagan know that that statement is true? He's a big time scientist, so it sounds like that's a scientific statement. But it's not. The statement that the cosmos is all there is, is not a scientific statement. There is no experimental data to back that up. There's no evidence that the cosmos is all there is. So it's not a scientific statement, what is it? It's a philosophical statement. Philosophy deals with the question of what's real and how do we know it's real? So the question or the statement that cosmos is all there is, is a philosophical statement. In fact, his statement reflects a specific school of philosophy called materialism. Materialism is a philosophy that says that the only thing that exists is the stuff we can see around us, or with an electron microscope, or with a Hubble telescope. That's all there is. Because they choose to believe that that's all there is, they adopt another form of philosophy which is called scientism. Not science, scientism. Scientism is a philosophy that says that the only way to gather information about what's real is to use the scientific method. So they have an assumption about the way the world works, materialism, the way the reality is, that only the material world exists, and they have a method for studying what exists, and that is scientism. But that's not science, that's philosophy. They don't have any evidence to tell, them, to tell them that science is the best way to study reality. They just know that science is the best way to study material worlds, material things. What if there's other stuff out there that's not materialistic? What if there are other things out there like God or the devil or heaven or hell? What if they exist, but you choose in advance not to pay attention to it? This is what materialism and scientism does. Materialism is a philosophy that says only the material world exists. I assume that the spiritual realm doesn't exist. So they don't show any evidence that God doesn't exist, that God doesn't exist, or that heaven and hell don't exist. They just say it doesn't. That's a philosophical position based on how they're choosing to view reality. It's not science. Christians love science. If you're doing, taking the approach that the materialists do, you're kind of like the guy up in the picture, the next one, with his eye covered. Because when you cover your eye, you don't see all of reality. Even now, if you cover your eye, you're missing some things. For example, it's really hard to drive or ride your bike with one eye covered because your depth perception is wrong. You lack some perception. You lack the triangulation to tell you how far away things are. You lack the ability to focus well. In fact, if you cover one eye, we're going to do this at the seminar, I'm going to demonstrate to you that in fact, that when you cover one eye, you actually have a blind spot in the other eye, where there's nothing there, where there's nothing there. This is an important observation for us, because if you go around life only looking at a certain part of reality, by definition, you're excluding another part of reality that might exist. So what we're going to do is avoid blind spots. How, are, how is Christianity different from this? First of all, in the Christian biblical worldview, we acknowledge that the material world exists. You can knock on your head and say, okay, that's real. I know that. Do that. Okay, you can go back and poke in your neighbor. That's a real, that's real stuff. The material world exists. How do we learn about it? We learn about it through human reason, our observations, and science. In fact, modern science owes its tools and methodologies to Christians several hundred years ago who believed that God created the heavens and the earth and you can understand God and you can understand the heavens and the earth by studying nature. And so they set up this method for, that we now call the scientific method, but it's a set of tools and processes for studying creation in order to identify what God has created. They did that on purpose. And so the idea that Christianity and science are, don't go together is simply wrong because modern science would not exist if it were for Christianity. And to be fair, without Islam as well. Because Islam also believes in, in reality 
and the kind of God-created universe that, that we do. There are some other important differences. But it was people of faith trying to understand the world around them that created science. Second, Christians, in addition to believing that Christians believe that the physical world exists, we also believe that the spiritual world exists. That there is this realm out there of things that are beyond the physical. How do we study this? We study this using reason and logic and revelation. This book. This book provides us with a basis for studying the spiritual realm. You can't study the spiritual realm using scientific processes because that's the wrong tool for that aspect of reality. You don't ignore physical reality. You put both sets of tools together. Third, Christians believe that the physical world and the material world, the spiritual world, they coexist. They're both going on at the same time, and that they interact with each other. And your mind is a good example of this. You know, the emotions that you feel when you go to a museum and you see a beautiful work of art, or you go to the Rocky Mountains, which I did several years ago, and I looked over the Rocky Mountains, I had never seen it in person before. It was just amazing, and it was. And what was funny is that the atheists I was traveling with, they were astounded by the beauty. That feeling that we have, that sense of beauty and awe at something amazing like that, that is not biology. There is no biological purpose for us to marvel at the Rocky Mountains or a space or a nebula out in the. In the, in the universe, or at the intricacy of the human eye, there is no biological, species-perpetuating reason that we do that. But we do. It's more than just our biology. I have a couple of twins in one of the classes that I teach. They're identical twins. They're genetically, they are identical. And if biology is the only thing going on, if materialism is the only thing happening, they should be identical in everything. They like different foods, they like different music. They're probably going to fall in love with a different woman. Probably. And you never know how these things, you could get really dramatic about it. But they're different people. Their minds are different from what their biology is. They have a, the identical, down to the gene, the identical biology. But their minds and their conscience and their soul is different. These are two separate things we're talking about. That's evidence for me that there's more than biology. Jesus himself is a great example. He's the prime example of these things happening together. Colossians 2.9. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Look at the three pieces of this puzzle that Paul gives us. The existence of the spiritual realm, that is, in the fullness of the deity. That means there's a deity out there. There's a supernatural being that exists who has a full set of characteristics. That's the fullness of the deity. Lives in bodily form. Bodily form, that's I'm talking about the physical. Lives in the bodily form. That's the interaction between the spiritual realm, the nature of God, and the physical body. This principle applies to us, your emotions, your having been created in the image of God. Everything that's you besides your body is from God. Yeah, I mean, the, the body's from God too, but it reflects that spiritual reality. We've got a friend who's lying in a hospital bed, significant brain injury from which she may never recover. But that brain that's so physically damaged, the, the mind and her soul, was not damaged at all by the car that hit her. It's her brain, the physical part of her, her personhood, her self, her soul, is different from her body. And it's true for every one of us. So why does this matter in terms of character, which Pastor Mark's going to talk about here in a moment? Well, if there is no God, and there is no spiritual realm, then that means that there is no purpose or meaning to your life. There's no meaning to it. You're just a clump of cells meandering your way through the universe, and there are no eternal consequences to your actions. That's the reality of it. If it's only the physical world, that's what is true. 
is that there are no eternal consequences. And any solutions we try to come up for dealing with suffering only deal with physical things. We have a sense that it ought to be about our spirit. And we are, are, even atheists have their hearts break when their kids get sick. Even atheists who don't believe in this, this, this spiritual realm have souls that, that are touched by heartbreaking situations. Their solutions, though, only deal with physical things. Their solutions can't really deal with true spiritual matters because their tools are their own tools. On the other hand, if the God of the Bible exists, and if the spiritual realm exists, and the physical realm exists, and these things interact, our flaws are genuine flaws. See, for atheists, they don't really have flaws. They have genetic abnormalities. You have a flaw in your spirit. You were created in the image of God and you failed to live up to it. That's why you mess up. That's why we sin. We have a solution because we have a whole picture of what's going wrong. They don't really have that picture because they're only looking at part of the picture. They can find solutions to stop your pain using chemicals in your body. They can't stop the ache in your spirit over betrayal or over a heartbreak over just lost life. They can't do it. So when we come back on March 29th, we're going to address some of these issues, provide some more illustrations, think about some ways to talk about people, talk to people about these questions. One of the things that I'd like to do is get an accurate count about who's going to be coming to the uh, event. And so it would be very helpful if you could register in advance. There are two ways you can do this. One is by connecting with the church office saying that you're going on our Facebook event page uh, or going to my website at legacyacademic.com slash register and I'm setting in the form, they're filling the form there so we can get a count so we can order the correct amount of materials.